or a few seconds. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Litigation Finance and Legal Insurance. This is brought to you by Lit Litigation Finance Journal. I'm your host, John Froyen. I want to thank everyone for joining, for attending. We have a really exciting panel. We're going to have a very insightful discussion on, you guessed it, litigation finance and legal insurance. Um, before we get to the panel, I want to just uh, go over some very brief housekeeping for you. So uh, you'll all be receiving an audio recording of this event. So please stay tuned for an email post event that will have the link to the recording. Um, and the format for the event is going to be a panel discussion followed by a Q&A with you attendees. So it'll be a roughly 45 to 50 minute panel discussion. We're going to save some time, 10 minutes at the end for uh, questions. And there's two ways for you to submit questions. One is through the comment section on LinkedIn. You can do that um, there on the bottom right of your LinkedIn panel. Just submit comments there. We'll be monitoring that. Or you can feel free to email me at uh, jfreund, that's J-F-R-E-U-N-D, at litigationfinancejournal.com. I'll be monitoring that as well. So we'll get to as many questions as we can, time permitting, at the end. I um, also want to mention that we have several more conferences in the works for this year. We're always welcome for your ideas. Um, if you have any, please submit those to us. You can email me. Uh, always open to your suggestions. Last thing is we have memberships available. So we offer daily reporting on the industry, including events, podcasts, a lot of contributed content. So please visit www.litigationfinancejournal.com for more information. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Rebecca Barabi. Rebecca is the CEO and founder of Avenue 33 LLC, a litigation finance consultancy that provides strategic advisory and brokerage services. She handles all types of matters within the litigation finance industry, from single case financings to law firm portfolios to fundless sponsored deals. Rebecca's background as a private money transactional lawyer and funder allows her to serve clients with both legal acumen and keen business insight. Rebecca, please take it away. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate you having me and thank you for everybody who has joined. I am also really thrilled to be here with a group of very distinguished panelists. Um, I will go through them now in their bios before we get started. Uh, we have Rocco Pirazzolo. Rocco has been the underwriting director of Harbor Underwriting since its incorporation, and now combines that with his role as the company's managing director. Rocco was also previously a director of the investment team of Harbor Underwriting sister company, Harbor Litigation Funding, and he has a ton of experience in, in complex litigation risk. We also are joined by Stephen Cariaco. Stephen is a managing director and senior lawyer in Aon's Lisk <laughs> Litigation Risk Group, where he has been evaluating litigation-related risks and structuring and placing litigation and contingent risk insurance solutions since 2019. Stephen was the insurance industry's first hire focusing exclusively on litigation and contingent risk insurance. And among other things, he coined the term judgment preservation insurance and was the first to conceive of using insurance to cost effectively monetize judgments. Prior to moving to Aon, Stephen was a trial and appellate litigator at Boyce, Schiller and Flexner for a little under a decade. We also have on the panel, Ross Weiner. Ross is the legal director of Certum Group where he focuses on underwriting litigation buyout, judgment preservation and adverse judgment insurance opportunities as well as litigation finance deals. Prior to joining Certum Group in 2018, Ross spent nine years as a litigator in the New York office of Kirkland and Ellis where he represented both plaintiffs and defendants in high profile commercial disputes. Finally, we have Boris Zeiser, who is the co-head of Schulte, Roth, and Zabel's Finance and Derivatives Group and a member of the firm's executive committee. With almost 30 years of experience across diverse asset classes, Boris focuses on asset-backed securitizations, warehouse facilities, secured financings, specialty finance lending, and commercial paper conduits. His practice encompasses a variety of asset classes, including litigation funding. So thank you to all the participants, and I think we should just dig right in. Um, so first, to start this conversation about litigation finance and insurance, let's just get a little background down for our participants. You know, there are a bunch of different types of insurance policies available for litigation finance matters. So let's start with ATE insurance after the event insurance. 
which exists solely in cost, sh cost shifting regimes. This has been around for several decades. Um, Rocco, can you get us started with how has the AT insurance market evolved over time and, and what should we expect going forward? So starting off with um, after event insurance and cost shifting, you're right to say that it does apply in cost shifting regimes where the cover they're sought is for opponents costs. But with the development over the years, it, it is also being taken out in non cost shifting regimes as well, uh, because the cover extends to uh, the expenses in, in a piece of litigation or arbitration, such as expert fees, and it can also extend to the lawyer's fees. Uh, and you can see that that type of cover would apply both in cost shifting as well as non cost, cost shifting regimes. But where after the event really began, it's very much a product of England and Wales. And I appreciate it's a, it, it is now a product that's used across the world, but its origins stem from a change to the law in England and Wales, where the purpose of the legislation was to save public money on certain types of cases. And so its origins go back to the year 2000, April 2000, for all intents and purposes, and it was originally being used for bodily injury cases, so personal injury and clinical negligence cases. It then started to stem out into insolvency disputes and commercial disputes. But even back then in the early years, the limits were quite modest. Um, and it was really with the, to a greater less extent, with the growth of the litigation funding market, um, that the AT market was being asked to respond to the type of cases that they were uh, backing. And so the limits of indemnity started creeping up as the AT market was trying to respond to the needs of the litigation funders, who were either saying to the claimants, you need to arrange your own those cost covers for the case that we're going to fund, or they said, that we're going to provide an indemnity for our first cost, but we need an AT policy to sit behind our indemnity. And so, um, so it's from there that we've got our first cost, which is now known as being available for big ticket litigation, so funded cases. So there's also a cover being sought for disbursements, those expenses that usually arise in litigation arbitration, and equally now for lawyers' fees. Um, now, historically, the AT market was very reluctant to insure lawyers' fees because the underwriters wanted to know that the lawyers were presenting cases to them, saying that they were good cases that should be backed. They wanted to have those lawyers with skin in the game. They had something to lose if they were wrong in their assessment of the merits of the case. Life has moved on. And there are some insurers, I don't want to talk universally, but there are some insurers who are willing to also insure a significant percentage of lawyers' fees. So coming back to the type of cover, so adverse cost cover, disbursement cover, lawyers' fee cover, what has also arisen is the need for security for costs. So um, what became apparent is that defendants and courts uh, were, were questioning whether or not an adverse cost policy could provide security at cost, where the traditional method of providing security was paying money into court or via bank guarantee. And so the AT market ended up devising two ways of dealing with that challenge. The first by an anti-avoidance endorsement, which basically gave the defendant the right to claim under the policy, even though they're not a party to the insurance policy, and to prevent the insurer from actually relying on any breach by the insured claimant or any exclusion clause under the policy. And the second method was by the insurer giving the defendant a deed of indemnity, which is technically a separate contract between the insurer and the defendant, whereby the insurer has agreed and agrees that it will pay adverse cost in the litigation on demand. And so uh, the policy becomes irrelevant. It's just a separate contract. It's a, 
uh, almost a financial instrument, one could say. The other product which has evolved um, has been uh, cross undertaking and damages uh, insurance. So, where a claimant would go to the court and ask for a freezing order uh, in order to freeze the assets of the opponent, it, it is standard practice for the court to ask the claimant who's seeking that order to provide an undertaking and damages in the event it ultimately transpires that that order was wrongly granted and that a defendant can demonstrate that they suffered a loss from their assets being frozen. Again, the AT market has evolved since those early years in 2000. Great. Thank you so much for that, Rocco. And, and let's talk about what other types of insurance have evolved and what other types of solutions you know, we can offer litigation finance clients, including law firms, litigants, and funders. Um, Stephen, do you want to jump in first? And then maybe Ross, you can follow. But of course, anybody can jump in at any time. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I'm happy to lead off here. And, and thanks again uh, to LFJ for, for having me and, and this esteemed panel. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation. But, um, you know, Aon's litigation risk group offers a number of different solutions that are of interest to litigation funders, their funded counterparties that are actually litigating these cases, uh, and the lawyers that are litigating funded cases as well. You know, for one, we talked a little bit or it was discussed or noted at the top of the call, Judgment Preservation Insurance, uh, which I'll refer to as JPI, uh, it's shorthand. Um, you know, essentially with Judgment Preservation Insurance, what we're doing is taking a judgment that has already been won, either, you know, an arbitration award, a trial verdict, maybe a summary judgment award, um, and ensuring that judgment against the risk that it gets reversed on appeal uh, or the damages get reduced on appeal um, or that, you know, there's a remand for a new trial or further proceedings or something like that. And what judgment preservation insurance allows uh, a funder or a litigant uh, or perhaps a contingency fee based counsel to do is effectively lock in a floor value of that judgment, right? Because if you've won a $100 million judgment and you take out a $75 million judgment preservation insurance policy, that JPI policy is going to guarantee you at least $75 million no matter what happens in the litigation. Because if your judgment gets reduced uh, to you know, $50 million, you're gonna get $50 million from the defendant, you'll get $25 million from the insurers. If your judgment gets wiped out on appeal, you'll get $75 million from the insurers on that policy. Another aspect of judgment preservation insurance that is I think very interesting to litigation funders is something that we call insurance-backed judgment monetization. That really only applies in situations where the defendant in the case that's being insured is you know money good for that judgment you know they're going to pay that judgment because they've got assets within the jurisdictional reach of the court sufficient to cover the judgment or because you know an appeal bond has been posted but essentially when you've got that dynamic where you have a rated insurance carriers guaranteeing you um that you'll get a final judgment of at least you know 75 million dollars on your 100 million dollar judgment and you've got a defendant who you know is going to pay that judgment you can go and get a loan that's backed by the combination of the judgment on the one hand and the judgment preservation insurance policy on the other hand at a much more attractive cost of capital than you would see on a typical kind of uninsured judgment monetization deal. And with that mechanism, funders are able to effectively you know, monetize their judgments that they've won in funded cases while that case is still pending appeal or maybe you know, on remand or something like that. And so funders can use insurance-backed judgment monetization in tandem with judgment preservation insurance in order to you know, pull forward proceeds and return those proceeds to their LPs earlier than they would otherwise be able to, reinvest those funds in new investments, et cetera. Another thing I'd also flag on that is that funders kind of regularly act as monetization counterparties on insurance-backed judgment monetization transactions with you know parties to litigation. Um, and so that's another way that funders are kind of involved in the space. And then the last thing, or really last two things that I'd flag are, you know, portfolio-based principal protection insurance, uh, where you know we can and insurance markets can wrap an entire portfolio of investments or um, you know, fund of investments with principal protection insurance that says, you know, you've got a hundred million dollars in capital committed to you know these 20 investments. 
to the extent that these 20 investments don't return, you know, X, Y, and Z dollars at different benchmark times in the policy, uh, the insurers on that policy will will pay out uh, to effectively guarantee, you know, either the full principal or some significant portion of the principal that's deployed across those cases. We are doing some, you know, single case or single investment principal protection insurance on a pre-judgment basis as well, but those are a little little harder to get done. And then just the last thing I'd flag is that we're now at Aon in our litigation risk group developing sort of pure duration risk focused solutions, which could either be you know, standalone policies or provide an additional layer of coverage that gets bolted onto a judgment preservation insurance policy that would otherwise only pay when a case becomes final. And so in other words, you know, these duration risk solutions would be, or policies would effectively say, if litigation X, does not reach finality by date Y, you know, the insurer on that policy will pay Z dollars to the insured. And then the insurer would have what's essentially a form of a subrogation right to recover its payout in the event that there isn't ultimately, you know, an adverse result in the underlying litigation after the trigger date in the policy. And our funder clients at Aon pretty much uniformly tell us that this sort of durational risk coverage is their number one need right now. And Aon is working to address that need kind of as a new frontier uh, in the space. And Stephen, if I may, what type of um, matters are getting um, that type of risk duration solution? Is it portfolios? Is it single cases? Is it law firms? It, like, what is, is there, can you give us a little more about that? Yeah, so that the, the duration risk is kind of already baked into the portfolio-based solutions right now. And, and I think when it comes to these portfolio solutions, we are very much in, you know, the maybe the bottom of the first inning uh, in developing these solutions. The marketplace has up until relatively recently been very focused on single case risk. We're really moving, uh, I would say, in the last 18 months or so, uh, very much in the direction of these portfolio solutions. And so portfolio solutions, by definition, really need some sort of, uh, you know, durational risk component to them because otherwise, you need to wait until every single investment in the portfolio resolves in order to make the claim on the policy, which just doesn't make sense and doesn't really help the policy holding funders. Um, but with respect to single case basis, that's kind of what we're looking to, to move forward with uh, in the coming months and apply that sort of durational risk uh, coverage to individual uh, single case policies. A big part of the reason why that's important as well is because with insurance-backed judgment monetization, you know, the real risk that the lender faces in lending against the combination of an insurance policy on the one hand and a judgment on the other hand is the risk that the litigation will just drag on so long that the amount of interest will kind of overtake the principal um, or whatever is going to be, not the principal, but what, what, whatever is expected to be returned via either the insurance policy or the judgment. And so having an additional layer of coverage that will cause what is otherwise a final judgments only policy to pay out when a given trigger date is reached, if the litigation has not yet reached a final judgment, is going to really kind of grease the wheels for a lot more insurance backed judgment monetization transactions where there is a concern that the litigation may just, you know, even though we like the merits of it, everyone likes the merits of it, it may just drag on and take you know, five, three plus, five plus years to resolve. Yeah, that sounds like a very attractive policy, assuming that the pricing is in line <laughs> with, that makes sense, right? Um, to buy two policies, particularly. Um, Ross, do you want to say anything further about this or should we move on to the next question? Yeah, sure. Just just briefly, one, I, I didn't realize we were in the presence of royalty. I didn't know Stephen coined the term judgment preservation insurance, but that's interesting to note. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. No. Adverse judgment insurance too. <laughs> okay. um, so, you know, we are seeing a lot in the duration risk space. I think one of the areas that is becoming uh, more prevalent in is mass torts where there's often, you know, that's the biggest question is how long will the risk, you know, how long will it take to play out? How long until uh, individuals will, will get paid? And so the law firms that take on those cases that for a very long duration, right? They've got lenders that they're, you know, responding to and they've got certain rates that they're trying to better. And so, insurance with a duration trigger can be very attractive in, in that space uh, as well. Um, just quickly, you know, Stephen just mentioned adverse judgment insurance. That's a product generally used by defendants um, in litigation where there's a risk that they're going to take a bad, a bad verdict or a bad judgment. 
Um, they think they've got strong defenses and a policy kind of helps them ring fence that, uh, that potential bad judgment so that in the event that it happens, insurance pays out um, and, and hopefully it doesn't. Um, and then, you know, briefly, um, from the, for the law, the lawyers on here, you know, one of the things we've seen a, a fair amount of and been working on recently is contingent fee or what we call work in progress or whip insurance for lawyers. And that has to do with, you know, law firms that take on cases on contingency, right, where there's a fair amount of risk involved that, you know, that could be zeroed out and using, you know, if the case is meritorious and we go through the underwriting process and at the end of the day, we, we like that kind of risk, you know, contingent fee insurance can help guarantee the lawyers, you know, a certain amount you know, whether it's their, their time and materials, so that they're, they're removing the downside risk of a zero and able to go forward in that litigation, you know, knowing as much. And so I'll, I'll pause right there. It's not a fair amount of this question. Turn it back to Rebecca. Great. Thank you so much, Ross and Stephen as well. Um, Boris, as a lawyer for a lot of these um, funders, can you tell us, you know, who how are law how are firms using these policies and what types of cases and portfolios and awards um are you seeing um these types of policies to to bring you know add value uh to the user uh sure thanks uh rebecca i, I maybe i'll take it in reverse because um i i think how the user maybe depends on what it is that they have uh but what it is that they have or could have uh, has really expanded um, over time. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to say it's limitless, uh, but I don't want to say that there's any particular limit. And what I mean by that is, uh, we are seeing insurance on a lot of our transaction that includes um, single event uh, type cases. It includes uh, mass tort cases. It includes IP, antitrust, breach of contract, trade secret theft. Um, and others. So I, I think in terms of what we're seeing at on, I think we're seeing it on a, a, a big cross section of uh, case types. Um, and, and then in terms of um, how it's used, um, it actually is a very uh, good interplay between how law firms use it. Uh, there are some nuances, which I'll get to in a moment, um, and, and funders. Um, at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, having insurance on your transaction accomplishes a number of things. Number one, of course, um, it covers the downside risk, uh, therefore potentially lowering the cost of the funding or monetization that you might be looking at. But the other thing that it does that I think is also important, uh, particularly for the user of the insurance and the holder of whether it's a JPI policy and so you're holding a judgment or you have a portfolio of cases or a single case that's pending pre-judgment, uh, like Steve was mentioning, um, is that it opens the universe to uh, other uh, lenders or investors because it not only uh, provides uh, protection on the downside of the investment, i.e. insurance, but it, it also enables you to create an instrument that benefits from a wrap from a single A, uh, typically, um, carrier. What that enables some uh, either funders or investors or lenders to do is actually then uh, be able to provide capital in a way that gives them the, uh, a more favorable regulatory treatment uh, that some of them might need. For example, if they're uh, traditional uh, investors in asset-backed securities or things like that that need um, an investment grade rating in order to be able to invest in something. This actually allows you to create an instrument that has that feature. And so it expands the universe of uh, potential lenders and investors. It, and then it, the other thing I would say is that as the types of policies have grown, you have things like uh, Steve was my judgment preservation insurance, but some of them also function uh, the way I would I would call them uh, cash flow or return smoothening instruments, where you obviously in a, a contingent litigation uh, scenario they're very unpredictable, could be very uh, choppy and lumpy uh, for the law firm and for the fund, and so some uh, insurance policies uh, enable you to have a smoother. Uh, picture when it comes to 
uh, returns, so that could, uh, in, whether it's individual policies on a slate of single event cases or a policy in a portfolio of litigations. Um, and then in terms of how they're used by law firms, um, actually in a number of ways, um, one is, um, as Steve had referred to this, which is locking in the fee because you are insuring a certain uh, minimal uh, recovery by virtue of having the policy uh, in place. Since these are contingent cases, uh, you're also at the same time then locking in some defined uh, minimum uh, fee quantum. And so that is uh, very helpful for some firms. The other is uh, if law firms want to borrow against that uh, fee, uh, which is not uncommon. It, like I said, not only opens up the universe of lenders, it also might lower the cost of that borrow. And uh, law firms do that from time to time for a variety of reasons. One is uh, for cash flow, because while uh, they're on the contingency case, they're not in just one, they're in many, whether that's in mass torts or whether it's um, in single event contingency cases where you're in a, a lot of them, they're expensive. And so uh, they need uh, support in order to uh, operate the business. The other is an acceleration of fees, uh, which they can monetize, uh, whether it's uh, balance sheet uh, pressures or year-end uh, goals and uh, or similar types of uh, financial support that is helpful to them if they can actually get uh, funding for it and insurance uh, it was very facilitative of being able to set up a transaction that enables you to accelerate uh, some of those fees as well. Thank you, Boris. Yes, I mean, this it's all, you know, as you kind of alluded to, it's all very interesting as the insurance industry evolves, how there can be different uses, different types of capital, um, because the structures really change, change the entire, you know, um, deal really, and what money is is necessary, and and you know what types of risk profiles, um, you know capital profiles would be would be interested in these types of cases. So thank you for that. Um, let's talk for a second about shifting risk. What steps can insurance providers take to ensure that law firms and funders are not merely shifting risk when looking to insure a claim? I mean, why else is insurance? worthwhile in this context? I think we've already kind of touched on this a little bit, um, you know, in, in immediately prior to this, talking about how you can kind of change the type of capital that's being infused um, and the uses for such capital. But I'd love to, Ross, hear your, hear your take on that. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, as an underwriter, right, adverse selection in cases is always like the most critical concern for me as I'm going through it, right, trying to discern the motive. And is it you know, simply getting bad risk off the books and, and replacing it with insurance to guarantee an outcome, or is there something more going on here? And so in terms of what steps insurance providers can take, you know, I think what we've seen a lot of and other folks have alluded to is more uh, portfolio uh, design. So it's not just one case and you're getting the benefit of, you know, cross collateralization among a number of cases. And that helps kind of take away some of the risk that, you know, really it's a law firm or a litigant looking to, or, or a lit funder trying to get rid of the bad risk off their books. Um, so I think, you know, portfolio basis solves that to an extent. Um, as for what, you know, other than risk shifting, why else is insurance worthwhile in this context? You know, as I was thinking about this question ahead of time, um, you know, we what we've seen more and more of recently is folks looking to monetize their judgments, right? And so to do it, they need to find funding. And some funding in this space is very, you know, litigation savvy, right? And can do the underwrite itself and, and come up with a conclusion. But other funding sources, traditional funding sources, are less apt to have that intelligence, you know, in-house, that, that personnel in-house. And so using insurance to guarantee a minimum amount on a judgment, right, enables you to widen that world of where you can seek to monetize a judgment because that insurance policy backstops it. And so being able to go to that third party and say, look, you don't need to do the legal underwrite here because someone's already done it. There's already insurance in place. Therefore, this is a good risk at these rates, right? Makes that that much easier. And so to, to me, that's, you know, other than risk shifting, right? That becomes a very worthwhile uh, use in this context. 
Absolutely. There is a sense of the warm and fuzzies, right? When other smart people have determined that things are working well. Um, thank you. Stephen, do you want to comment on this? No, I, I would just echo everything that Ross said. I mean, motivation is very, very important to insurers and to brokers like my team at Aon. And we are all highly attuned to adverse selection risk. Um, and certainly, you know, insurance-backed judgment monetization is a I think a good and very common motivation that we see in the JPI arena. Um, we've just as another kind of example of a motivation for judgment preservation insurance, we've had clients who have significant amounts of debt, both secured debt that is less expensive to service and unsecured debt that is more expensive to service, ensure a judgment that they've won in order to basically transform that expensive unsecured debt into cheaper debt that's secured by the judgment and the JPI policy, same sort of principle as what we see in an insurance-backed judgment monetization, except you know it's using the insurance to bring down the cost of that debt rather than uh, to take on more debt. And then certainly, as Boris noted earlier, you know with principal protection insurance for, for portfolios, the two main motivations are really um, to lower the cost of capital uh, and then to attract new investors whose investment guidelines may you know effectively prohibit investments in litigation finance because of the risk involved, uh, because by you know protecting a portfolio of these investments with A-rated insurance paper, you're basically turning that portfolio into an investment grade asset. Right, it's it's really exciting. What, um, Boris, what is the law firm perspectives on shifting risk and how do you balance that risk so funders can establish kind of long-term relationships? Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, it, fundamentally, and, and obviously by definition, you get a policy, it's covering some risk. So in, in that sense, I think, you, you know, obviously, undeniably, it's risk shifting. Um, but I tend not to focus on that as much as I focus on uh, what it's actually doing, which to me, is really uh, enabling law firms, clients, uh, funders to finance uh, this asset class more efficiently because you can really if you think about it if you can also look at non-recourse financing and you can say well that's also risk sh shifting right because if something defaults etc you can't get go beyond what the actual asset is so in some sense if you got financing and it's not recourse you've also shifted the risk in, in in that way but i look at it as a financing not necessarily just as a pure uh risk uh shifting exercise and so then you might think about um, perhaps alignment of interest in some sense between funders and lawyers. And if you're trying to foster a relationship, uh, a longstanding relationship, repeat cases, repeat deals, funders and lawyers, you might think, well, have, have you actually shifted uh, the risk in such a way that somehow uh, the lawyers, for example, might behave differently than, than they might in the absence of insurance. And I don't think um, that's the case because as I think everyone probably knows, lawyers are actually subject to disciplinary rules, which actually require lawyers to act in the best interests of uh, their clients. I don't think any lawyer, certainly I'm not aware of any lawyer that would risk their license just by virtue of there being insurance uh, in place. So I don't think that it detracts from uh, the uh, uh, vigorousness uh, or zeal of uh, prosecution of the case. I think lawyers act in the best interests uh, of the client. But I think what it does do is uh, take some financial pressures off law firms sometimes, and I think enable them to maybe focus better or more on other, other aspects of the case, but always still subject to the disciplinary rules. So I think, I don't think insurance has any negative effect on uh, those relationships or the risk shifting of impacting uh, how the parties might uh, behave vis-a-vis -vis each other. I think it's actually a, a very facilitative uh, way of fostering uh, those relationships and those transactions. Awesome, thank you. Um, let's shift over to the practical a little bit. Uh, who in these matters should be seeking the insurance? Should it be the law firm, the litigant, or the funder? Um, Ross, do you want to take that one? 
Sure. I mean, the easy answer here is D, right? All the above. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, that's really too simple. You know, insurance is always about the risk proposition. So kind of at its most basic, right? If you're a litigant, you've won a judgment and you think there's a one third chance, right? That it's going to get wiped out, but you could pay 15% to get judgment preservation that preserves the whole thing. Like as a math proposition, right? That's, that's someone that should be getting insurance. No question about it. Um, you know, as folks in the industry think about this, you know, a favorite story of mine uh, comes back from a, a contingency fee case I worked on a long time ago. We had won a sizable judgment. There was still an appeal to come. And there were three key partners on the case, right? And two of whom were cowboy litigators, right? Didn't want to give up any of the upside, thought the judgment was bulletproof, you know, really. And the third was more cautious and thought maybe monetization is a good idea. Maybe we should take some of the risk. And they, you know, these partners went at it. And uh, at the end of the day, the cautious partner kind of won out. And when the judgment was reversed a year later, it was a pretty prescient bet. But those are the kinds of discussions, I think, at the law firm level, right, about, you know, giving up some of your upside in exchange for a guarantee that go on all the time. And it, that, that can be a question of economics. It can be a question of personalities as well. Um, you know, I'm on the different side of that equation now as we assess these risks. But I think that's the thing that law firms, litigants, and funders should, should bring to the question. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen, do you want to comment on that? No, I think Ross's answer is perfect. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> well, then I'll throw this one to you, Stephen. What are the markers of a case or a portfolio that insurers look for when determining whether or not to provide insurance? Sure. So, you know, we already talked about motivation and how crucially important that is and how we need to really kind of suss out whether there is any sort of adverse selection going on, which is usually pretty easy for our team at Aon to do kind of as a threshold matter before a risk even reaches Ross's desk or, you know, the desk of any of the other uh, many underwriters in our space. Um, but with respect to, you know, other considerations, you know, on single case judgment preservation insurance, for example, we're really looking at three things. One, likelihood of affirmance. Two, likelihood of a damage award reduction, and if so, kind of where damages may be reduced to. And then third, you know, what is likely to happen in this case, both with respect to liability and with respect to damages, if the case gets remanded by the appellate court for a new trial. And on a single case uh, placement, you are really, and insurers and the broker should also be doing a very, very kind of excruciatingly deep dive into all of those different questions. Um, on portfolios, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, we're looking at the diligence that the funder has compiled uh, in underwriting all the cases. Uh, we're looking, you know, we're kind of diligencing their diligence. Depends on the size of the portfolio, but if you're talking about a portfolio of dozens of different um, dozens of different case investments that have been made, and all of the investments are at different stages, it's hard to kind of do the same sort of underwrite on every single one of those uh, case investments as you would on a judgment preservation insurance placement, where you've got you know a fixed and finite appellate record that you can really serve up on a silver platter to um, to the insurance underwriter. So there we're doing a lot of underwriting, not only of, you know, the cases in the portfolio, but the funders track record, right? The funders uh, underwriting processes and procedures, the bona fides of the personnel that are doing the underwriting for the funder, in addition to looking at, you know, all of their, their diligence folders kind of under the hood at the investments that make up that portfolio. And then for things like insuring loans to law firms, which is really, you know, kind of blown up in the past year or so, particularly as Ross mentioned earlier in the mass tort context, we're looking at a number of different things, right? We're looking at duration risk and expected proximity to a settlement event. We're looking at the law firm that's receiving the loan from the funder, uh, their track record of solid damages outcomes. We're looking at whether the cases uh, at issue are likely to survive motion to dismiss and motion for summary judgment. We're looking for sympathetic narratives and sympathetic plaintiffs, favorable venue. Uh, it's important to you know, have credit worthy defendants. Um, we're looking at concentration risk and mitigation efforts. We're looking at whether there's a portion of the collateral that's not given any value in loan to value calculations, but can still provide some upside uh, to the insurer um, or to the, you know, the overall transaction. 
We're looking at firm specific considerations like, you know, whether uh, the cases are going to be staffed properly and intake and case management systems, things like that. And then we're also looking at funding terms and conditions. You know, we really need to see reasonable and appropriately conservative LTVs. Uh, we need to see priority and first lien security interest on all of the borrower's assets, including not only existing cases, but also future cases. Uh, we need to see key individual personal guarantees. And we're looking for covenants, you know, with respect to ongoing financial reporting of the borrower, you know, right of first refusal on refinancings or future financings, prohibitions against disposition of assets. Um, you know, we want the lender to have viewing rights uh, for the borrower's operating accounts, annual limitations on distributions, loans, uh, you know, salary, bonus to key individuals, those sorts of things. Those are all the sorts of considerations that we're looking at on those loan to law firms. So, you know, in some, it really depends on the type of insurance policy, but any way you slice it, whatever you're insuring when, when it comes down to the litigation risk at hand, it will be a very, very thorough underwriting and diligence process. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. I think, you know, let's be honest, all of those points, which could make perfect sense to me, really boil down to, you know, is everybody in the in this transaction, but particularly from an insurance perspective, the insurer going to be able to collect on these on these matters, right? That's yeah. I always tell my clients from a very practical perspective when you're looking at any type of litigation finance loan or insurance, the question at the end of the day is very economically practical. Um, anyway, like uh, moving on, uh, on and, and you know onto the uh, additional practical questions. Uh, Rocco, can you tell us a little about the pricing um, on these deals and what you know pricing looks like in general and, and how risk adjusted it is um, for certain of these policies? Yes, uh, well, first and foremost, if I can just go back to your previous question, just to make one point, because Stephen gave a very thorough answer, but certainly one thing I would like to say about AT insurance and underwriting is, is that underwriters tend to they tend to look at a case going to trial, and we tend to try and ignore uh, prospects of settlement because fundamentally, we, I think we all know that they're cases that we think would win. We all have gut feels and we all sense that they should settle and that they should never see the inside of a courtroom. And the reality is that some of those tend to go to trial and surprise us. And equally, those that we think are going to win are the ones that can go um, can end up losing quite easily. So. Uh, going back to the thoroughness of the underwriting. But coming back to your specific question about AT and uh, pricing. Um, so the, the, there are potentially two models really in the art event insurance uh, space. Um, the most common model is one where a deposit premium is paid on inception of on taking out the policy where uh, the balance of the premium uh, so for the cover is paid out of a successful recovery. So not at all, out of a judgment, out of recoveries in the action. And so the insurer can genuinely be seen to be having skin in the game. And so obviously uh, they, they are very much aligned to other stakeholders in the litigation, whether that's the law firm, the litigation funders who are seeking their return on investment. Uh, so that is quite a common uh, premium uh, structure, um, but equally we do get involved in cases that don't involve monetary outcomes, and those are priced uh, differently where uh, a premium is paid in instalments, where the first instalment is where the policy is taken out, a second premium might be paid midway in the litigation cycle, with the third 60 days before trial, then the, the, the object of that being is very much if a case is resolved earlier than the trigger point for payment of the second or third instalment, then um, obviously the shutter comes down at the time that the case concludes. So they're not necessarily paying the full premium. They bought the exposure in the event a case goes into trial, which is obviously the worst case scenario. Thank you very much. Um, and then are there any recent- Yeah, developments? actually, Rebecca, could I maybe just chime in briefly just because I want to explain the, the pricing on 
the other sorts of solutions outside of. Um, Absolutely. Yes, please do. Yeah. So, uh, you know, let's just talk judgment preservation first. Historically, the pricing for judgment preservation has typically come in at around, you know, 10 to 15 percent rate online. And rate online is just insurance speak for the cost of a one time upfront premium payment uh, expressed as a percentage of the overall limits that you're purchasing. So 10% rate online on a $10 million policy would be a $1 million premium payment. 15% rate online on a $100 million policy would be a $15 million premium payment. We have seen those prices harden a bit recently, and we expect continued hardening over the coming months due to some recent developments in insured cases where, for example, cases with insured judgments have been remanded for a new trial. Um, but pricing and, you know, who's to say where that hardening will go to, but certainly wouldn't surprise me if, you know, the new 10 to 15 is, you know, 15 to 20 and potentially, you know, more than 20, but the pricing on judgment preservation insurance and other sorts of single case risks like adverse judgment insurance, um, is definitely risk adjust adjusted, you know, while 10 to 15 has been where most risks have priced over recent years, we've done these deals as low as sub 5% rate online and as high as the mid 20% range, because pricing is ultimately a function of the risk profile of the litigation to be insured and is therefore bespoke. And then just really quickly on portfolios, more difficult to generalize there because those are really hyper bespoke, um, even more so than single case policies are. Uh, but there's usually a front end premium as well as a back end component in the event that the portfolio does well, which means that the insurer basically shares in both the risk and the reward and that you know optimally aligns everyone's interest. So I just wanted to to point that out because the pricing on the sorts of stuff that we're doing in the US outside of the ATE market in London definitely priced differently and structured differently than the ATE risks are. Sure. That makes sense. And then can you also talk about like how stable is that pricing? I mean, I know you gave ranges there's no like hard and fast rule here, but I just am going to combine a few questions because we're running a little bit um, towards the end, but given, you know, where we are and the track record of these policies and what's happening, what can we expect in terms of pricing in, and changes um, that will, you know, or outcomes that have occurred in the track record of these policies, you know, that may or may not affect future pricing? Yeah, um, I'm happy to Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go, go, please, please go oh, ahead. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll touch on that really quickly. And then I think I'd love to hear Ross's perspective as an, an, the actual insurer on the panel. But, you know, other than I think pricing increasing and, you know, we'll see where it increases to and kind of levels off at, I think you're going to see a lot more insurer selectivity, uh, particularly around specific kinds of cases. I think patent litigation is a big one. I think we, we've seen a couple months ago a, a sort of, freeze overtake the insurance market with respect to patent litigation that involves section 101 patent eligibility risk. I think we're going to see that kind of extend to patent litigation that has a lot of IPR risk. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot more selectivity um, and, and I hopefully a focus as well on portfolio solutions rather than single case solutions in order to help cross collateralize and spread the risk around. But, but Ross, I'd be very interested to hear you know, what thoughts you have as well on that? Yeah, I mean, look, I think on pricing generally, right? I think we're at a period of time where in the last, I think two to three years, there's been just an avalanche of JPI opportunities and adverse judgment opportunities. And so it's created some of the biggest towers I think this industry has ever seen. I think over the next, let's call it two to five years, right? We're going to see the results of those policies. How many of them are, are folks coming off risk entirely without any loss? How many of the towers are going to fall entirely, right? If there's a reverse and then a bad, you know, result on a second trial. And I think all of that is going to inform the price shakeout that Stephen just mentioned. I think, you know, it's all, it's all really good and well and happy talk, right? When everyone's doing it, but it's like where the rubber meets the road is how these cases are, you know, they ultimately play out, right? The merits, the results, the settlements or the judgments. And so, I think there's going to be, you know, potentially a reshifting uh, in the industry on pricing. Stephen mentioned, you know, maybe instead of 10 to 15, it could be 15 to 20 or maybe 20 to 30. But ultimately, that's going to be a result of how good the underwriting has been to date and how these cases play out. And that's something we should really watch for in the next, you know, like I said, two to five years here. Mm -hmm. I just how... jump in the air, so, um, just a very quick comment, but I know we're running short of time. Sure. One thing to be very mindful of in insurance 
is, is, is that pricing is right so that the market is sustainable. And I know that's the point that both Stephen and Boris are touching on. And the, the danger of having a, a race to the bottom in pricing, uh, because certainly I saw uh, an AT policy where they need an excess layer. And there were nine insurers on the primary layer, and there's only one left in the market. So that's the danger of a race to the bottom. You've got to make sure it's sustainable because uh, otherwise, you know, we know how this story might end. Good point. Good point. I guess, you know, from that perspective, though, another thing that I get a lot of questions about when um, I'm dealing with parties who are considering using insurance is, you know, the age old question is, are buying these insurance policies just further invitation for litigation? You know, how can funders and, and users of these policies get comfortable that these policies, in fact, are going to pay out upon a loss? Uh, and Boris, do you want to talk about that, maybe about how you see um, funders getting comfortable with that? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, there are a couple, uh, several things I, I would say. Um, one, I think, um, obviously, you want to go with reputable carriers. You look at the carrier ratings, which gives you the financial uh, health of the carriers. Um, I would also say you could look at the track record for payments, not only necessarily on uh, policies of this type, but if it's a multi-line carrier um, payouts they've historically made and the track record on that in other um, areas. Um, I would also look at uh, a carrier's um, diligence process. Are they doing really good? due diligence on the case and really understand the risk. I think that helps avoid um, any sort of uh, dispute um, around that aspect of it uh, later on. So I, I, I think it's it's track record related and in other areas. I think it's rating, I think it's reputation, I think, and I, I think it's, it's the uh, level of diligence that they do to make sure they really understand uh, the risks they are assuming. Yeah, and I would just add here that, you know, we have seen that these policies pay. Um, you know, this is fine, at least with respect to single case policies like judgment preservation insurance, adverse judgment insurance, you know, it's final judgments only coverage. So it's not going to pay until you the, the litigation really has reached its terminal point. Um, but effectively, it's a math problem, right? So with JPI, you've got a judgment of 100 million, we're giving you $75 million in coverage. To the extent that a final judgment awards you anything less than $75 million, the insurers on that policy are going to, you know, true you up to that $75 million mark. On the defense side, you know, plaintiff is seeking $100 million in damages. We're giving you a $75 million policy with a $25 million deductible. To the extent you face a final judgment or have to pay a final judgment that's a dollar more than $25 million, the insurers will pay above that. Um, and, you know, we have seen large losses on, on these policies pay out. We've seen them pay out quickly uh, and without uh, really any fights from the insurers. I mean, the one recently that we had, the insurer wanted to do a call with the client um, or with the insured really just to understand what they got wrong and what we all got wrong in the underwriting. Um, and so, you know, I think we've got now a track record of these policies paying out, certainly. Um, you know, the, the considerations that, that Boris noted are all very important. The other one I would just flag is, you know, the exclusions on the policy. Really, there's typically one, maybe two exclusions in these policies. Uh, the main one is for fraud or misrepresentation by the insured in obtaining the insurance coverage. Uh, we've never had an insurer rely on that exclusion to refuse payment on an Aon policy. We're not aware of any insurers doing that on any policies placed by any other brokers. Um, but, you know, that's really the main one. And then the other one is uh, a requirement. And sometimes this is framed as an exclusion, sometimes not. Essentially, there's a requirement, of course, under these policies, because they're final judgments only, that the insured continue to zealously litigate the case as if they were a prudent uninsured. Um, and again, we haven't seen an insurer kind of take a position that, that uh, an insured failed to do that. But that's really the only other mechanism that insurers have to uh, avoid paying these claims. It's fraud or failure to zealously litigate. And of course, when you have a deductible or a retention on these policies where the insured still has some meaningful skin in the game, that's a great um, you know, mechanism to ensure that the insured does zealously litigate all the way to the bitter end. 
Well, thank you so much for those answers. I feel like we have so many other things that we could discuss because this topic is so chock full of substance, but I think it's time for us to turn the call back over to John to answer some questions. Thanks so much, Rebecca, and great job moderating. We really appreciate that. And thank you to all the panelists. You guys did a fantastic job. We do have a few questions here. Uh, this first one, it would go to any of, the, any of the insurers on the panel. So in cases where there is capital protection insurance, so that's when a, a funder's capital is insured in the event that the underlying matter is a loss, do you offer better pricing because your risk is lower? I'll leave that open to whoever wants to take it. This would be a question on if your pricing is better in uh, capital protection insurance due to any kind of lower risk. I'm not sure that I fully track the question. I mean, the, the question may be more kind of gauged towards a, a funder and, and maybe the, the pricing that the funder is getting. But from an insurance broker and insurance company perspective, I mean, the what we're looking at is the the risk that the litigation presents, right? And so um, if, uh, you know, the, the pricing that the insurance companies are going to offer and providing the coverage is going to be a function of the risk inherent in that litigation, whether that impacts the pricing that the insurer kind of offers to its insured counterparty, you know, I would expect uh, that there are a number of considerations that go into that. I think the insurer's risk goes down, which is a consideration that maybe would lead the funder to provide, or rather the funder's risk goes down, which could lead them to offer, you know, cheaper funding, but the funder is also paying a premium now on the insurance coverage, which, you know, could cut in the other direction. So, you know, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question, but from the insurer perspective, um, you know, we are really looking at, and from the broker perspective, we're looking at the risk inherent in the litigation in order to determine how best to price the insurance policy that protects that litigation risk. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would add to that and, and probably a third day confirm the observation made by Stephen, whether a case is funded or not, basically it's the claim that's being assessed. And the fact that a litigation funder is involved it, it is ultimately the underwriter is going to be making their own assessments independently. And whilst there is a funder involved, it might give comfort, but that's all it might give. Um, the underwriting assessment will be undertaken come what may because we're focusing on the case and the risks in the case yeah i think that might have been what what he was driving at so i appreciate that thank you um next question again for the insurers on the panel uh do you provide wraps for the funding of for, for litigation funding of, of matters and also is there legal insurance for whistleblower cases in particular um, I think I think the answer to both those questions is yes. We've seen certainly insurance for that, that can wrap, you know, for for a number of cases, which I think is what the question is referring to. And then on the whistleblower front, um, those cases can be trickier depending on kind of what's available publicly and what can be disclosed to do a fulsome underwrite. But um, we have definitely seen examples of those, and so I would say that insurance is available on those cases. And just uh, give us a call. <laughs> You know, whistleblower cases, the answer is yes. Okay, that's expected. Um, all right, we have time for one final question. I think, Boris, I can point to you at, on this one. Uh, you spoke earlier about um, how to, uh, about, about policies paying out, insurance policies paying out, and how to ensure that you might be able to, to collect from insurance companies. And you talked about uh, dealing with A-rated insurers and uh, uh, reputation and that sort of thing. Uh, what about terms and conditions? Is there anything uh, that you look for in terms and conditions that, that should be contained? Any, any terms and conditions that should be contained in the policy for the protection of the insured? Well, I think, actually, I think it might've been Steve who mentioned this. If, if not, I apologize if I'm attributing it to the wrong person. But I think it, it's partly what's in, what's in the policy in the sense that you want to make sure that it has the right terms that you expect in terms of what it is insuring, how much it is insuring, when it's supposed to pay, and what in terms of not only case resolution, but timing, what you have to do to make a claim so that it is very clear 
uh, as to what you have to do. Also very, very clear what obligations you have during the term of the policy. But as Steve also, I think, said, what's also very important is what it, that it does not have um, a lot in the way of subjective exclusions um, where, you know, you can, what we generally see, at least so far in, in these policy forms is that in terms of exclusions, and they're often based on information that is provided, but it's it's typically pretty clear as to what that information is. So, for example, uh, identifying the case uh, correctly and so certain uh, objective uh, pieces of information that you can provide and be comfortable that they are correct. Um, and and so, uh, just in in summary. You want to make sure that the process is simple and clear in terms of making claims. The process is simple and clear in terms of what you're supposed to do during the term of the coverage, um, and that uh, the exclusions are as as few as, of course, you 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 can have, but also that they are um, uh, objective, um, and you feel comfortable that there's not going to be a dispute over whether. Um, you have uh, been able to satisfy the, uh, them or not. All right. Thank you for that. We really appreciate that. And that is all the time we have for today. So thank you all for attending. We really appreciate, we really appreciate you uh, joining today. You're all going to receive a full event recording. So please stay tuned for that. You'll be receiving multiple emails from me. Uh, I want to thank our moderator, Rebecca Barabee, who did a fantastic job today. Really appreciate it, Rebecca as well as, of course, our panelists, Stephen Kiriako Jr., Ross Weiner, Boris Iser, and Rocco Pirazzolo did a fantastic job. Thank you all so much. Your answers were fantastic and really helped shine a light on this, the intersection of these two industries. So um, yeah, one final thing, uh, you can check out past conferences on our uh, website. You can view all the daily reporting and industry news and current events, www.litigationfinancejournal.com. Thank you all so much. We hope to see you at the next event. Take care and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Yeah.